a very powerful story. I had the privilege of meeting Mike and hearing Mike's testimony in terms of how Pastor Everett and he holds Pastor Everett's forgiveness was the moment of grace that changed his life and he became redeemed. So because of you, uh, how one person can make a difference. Not only that, Pastor Everett has been a national figure in testifying in all legislative bodies in the states uh, that are considering the abolition of the death penalty. And what Reverend Everett failed to mention that the level of his forgiveness was so complete that he went on to officiate the marriage of the man who murdered his son. Bishop Campbell, we very much look forward to your comments. I thought that what I would do is very briefly take a look at how theologically and pastorally the church, especially in the United States, has come to the point of seeking the end to capital punishment. And to talk about it in terms of a development of consciousness, but also to talk about it in considering very clearly and as deeply as I can what is at stake and what are the questions that arise. I find it rather extraordinary that after Dr. Symbolic asked me to become part of this uh, forum on capital punishment, I had two experiences which seem more than a coincidence, although I think as one French philosopher once said, a coincidence is an event in which God simply wishes to remain anonymous. One happened just last Friday that for our annual breakfast with the bishop, I had the privilege of speaking alongside a member of the Ohio Supreme Court, uh, Justice Pfeiffer, who, as you know, wrote the law as a legislator, helped write the law of the law as a legislator, uh, which permitted capital punishment back in Ohio. And he has now come to the conclusion that in fact it is not simply ineffective, it is simply wrong. And he asked a very interesting question last Friday. It was a rhetorical one, which he himself answered. He says, does this indeed serve our society well? And his answer was no. The other event was something that occurred when I was traveling down to Portsmouth. Some of you may know that the Diocese of Columbus extends over a very wide territory, and I've gotten very, uh, to know Route 23 very intimately. And I was going down there for a pastoral reason, and as I was passing Chillicothe, this strange, dusty brown bus rolled onto 23, and I looked at it, and at first, I thought they were transporting, li uh, transporting livestock, because they had these bars across these high windows. Then I realized it was a prison transport. I followed that bus right down 23 until we came to Lucasville, and it turned to the left. And I knew that what was being transported was an individual who was going to be executed. I prayed a rosary for him as I went by. I, I thought what must be going through his mind at that time and I have subsequently realized he was the one that was executed last week. And I think of these events and I think back on how Christians particularly have thought about this supreme punishment in our criminal system. And I go back as I hope most Christians go back and that is to sacred scripture. And it might be surprising that when you read sacred scripture, you will find 
no condemnation of capital punishment. And in fact, in the Old Testament, it appears as if God himself ordered this punishment. And I'm thinking, well, perhaps in the ministry of Jesus, there is a sign. But you may remember that when Jesus stood before Pilate, and Pilate asked him, do you realize that I have the power to crucify you or to let you go free? What did our Lord say in reply? You would not have that power unless it were given to you by God. And then as I thought more deeply about this, I realized also that in all of sacred scripture, there is no condemnation of slavery. But then when you read St. Paul's letter to Philemon, in which Paul is sending back a slave, Onesimus, to his master after the slave had escaped. And what Paul writes then to the master, I think, destroyed any moral foundation for the institution of slavery. But as the Christian people began to think about not only capital punishment, but the whole nature of punishment itself, there was an attempt to clarify what is the relationship between the demand of justice and the exercise of mercy. And how are the two related? So I would ask you to remember that actually in sacred scripture and in the tradition of the Christian people, there is no overt condemnation of capital punishment. Think also that when there was a very large movement for the abolition of perhaps not all forms of capital punishment, but at least the most torturous and the most heinous, it came at a time when there was a growing disbelief in eternal life, in the next world, as it were, coming out of the 18th century where, in fact, natural death becomes the ultimate evil rather than the loss of eternal life with God. Now, I think this is a cause for some really deep thinking. And within this context, as the church, and especially uh, my tradition, which I know best, the Catholic tradition, they go back to considering what is then the nature of punishment, of legal punishment. What does it do? How does it fulfill the demands of justice? And there are normally then four reasons or four uh, outcomes that are expected from the application of criminal justice, although I've always found that term uh, at least ambiguous, sometimes a little analog uh, uh, amorphous. It's criminal, but yet justice. But is justice ever criminal? But the demands of justice call for some kind of reaction to a, a disruption of community life, a destruction of, of life and, and property. Justice is to be maintained. And there is a hope that when punishment is then applied, it is applied, hopefully, to achieve one or two or three or all four ends. The first end is rehabilitation that the perpetrator be able, through this kind of application of, of uh, legal justice, to be able 
to confront what has been injured or destroyed and then be uh, restored to human society. There is secondly the concern for the defense of society and particularly for the defense of individuals from any further deprivation on the part of the wrongdoer. Thirdly, there is retribution. But retribution is not revenge. Retribution is an understanding that something has been broken, something that has been lost. There has to be some kind of restitution that, that is uh, important as part of, of this application of legal justice. And fourthly, deterrence. Now actually this fourth one is probably the most difficult to determine whether in fact it fulfills what people hope it will fulfill. The more severe the punishment becomes does not necessarily translate into a decrease in the number of crimes committed. And in fact, as a lot of commentators pointed out, deterrence only uh, has an effect apparently when in fact the punishment is uh, leveled upon the wrongdoer publicly. Now this can be very offensive because it can lead to public spectacle. In fact, uh, many Christians uh, instinctively reacted against this because of what they remembered in the, the Roman arena, those public uh, spectacles of the, the killing, not only of criminals but of all opponents or necessary opponents of the state. Is the legal punishment actually a deterrent. And most commentators on this say that this is probably the weakest argument, especially for capital punishment. Very difficult to, to determine. But this application of legal justice cannot be an act of vengeance or public hatred. That is why it can only be applied by the state, which apparently, perhaps in some many instances, acts completely out of uh, any, uh, with a lack of self-interest whatsoever. But then, as we began to think about these four purposes of punishment and apply them to the punishment of, uh, of death, we have to ask ourselves, does the death penalty really fulfill the demands of justice and the purposes of legal punishment? And this is where I think the Catholic Church has begun to consider a, pruden a prudential judgment about its use in society. And especially under the leadership of Pope John Paul II and Benedict XVI, there has developed a wider and more explicit context in which these questions have to be discussed. And it's largely because both of those popes personally experienced two of the worst totalitarian systems in human history, in which millions of people were destroyed. And for both John Paul and Benedict, there was a growing sense that there seems to be a deeper lack of respect for human life in general. 
especially when, as Stalin once said, the death of one person can be a tragedy. The death of 20 million is a statistic. And the kind of cheapening of the sense of the dignity of human life. And it's from that that John Paul II and the American bishops have come to a conclusion that capital punishment no longer fulfills the purpose for which it seems to have been accepted for, uh, for centuries. It doesn't seem to deter from any further crime. It certainly eliminates the possibility of rehabilitation. It causes us to ask ourselves, what is the retribution for the death of another? What is it that we can restore in that instance? And the conclusion is that society now has ways of protecting itself from even the most heinous perpetrators without resorting to the death penalty. And because of these two things, one, the simple uh, sense that it is not doing that which people thought it would do for the good of society, plus the fact of living in an era of a cheapening sense of human life and human dignity. The church asks, is, asks what is the prudential decision? And if you read John Paul II's letter on the Gospel of Life, in which he introduced uh, this opposition to the death penalty, you will note that he does not deny the right of a society to impose it. What he says is that we are at a state in our, our human history in which prudently we are called upon to consider more deeply the value of life, the dignity of human life, and the fact that we can now protect ourselves even from the worst of the criminals without resorting to the widespread application of this death penalty. And as uh, Reverend Everett said, we have to ask ourselves what does the application of the death penalty say about us as a society? Even though we may accept its righteousness in some circumstances, as the Christian people had for, uh, for centuries, right now in our own time, understanding the history that we went through in the 20th century, What does it mean for our society? Now in, of course, the, the Catholic community, there is an extraordinary desire to defend human life from, natural, uh, from uh, conception to natural death. And often the opposition to the use of capital punishment is rolled into what I think generally we like to call the pro-life movement. We have to make a distinction between the fact that when we talk about things such as abortion or euthanasia or mercy killing, we are talking about the killing uh, of an innocent. Capital punishment is in a different category. But yet, even though it's in a different category, philosophically and theologically, and psychologically, still we ask the question, how is it we preserve the dignity of human life as a society? And what does it say about us? And for this reason, the bishops of the United States have called consistently for the abolition of capital punishment. 
And we pray that more and more this will, in fact, be a call that will change all human hearts. So I thank you for listening. Thank you very much.